my name is Damian Miller. I'm very happy to be here today at TEDx. Um, I'm, in, I'm an American. I was uh, born and raised in New York City, but I was also, uh, I'm also half British and so much of my university took place in the UK. Today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about my story, which involves moving to Bangalore 18 years ago, where I co-founded a company, a solar company called Orb Energy. Uh, I also met my wife, who is an alum of this prestigious institution, and we've had uh, three lovely kids together. So I hope from my story today, one, you will find it interesting in and of itself, but two, that I, there'll be some lessons that you can also take on your journey, especially as you navigate your career. Where did it all begin for me? Well, first it began in university at the London School of Economics in the early 1990s. I was an undergraduate there, and I developed a fascination in the, in the, in the power of renewable energy. Specifically, I was interested in the ability for solar power to provide us with abundant amount of, of electricity, with no pollution, no noise, and ideally, no wars over oil as we move forward as a global society. Now, when I looked around the world at the various solar markets that existed, I could see that they were few and far between. In fact, most of them that existed existed only because they were heavily subsidized in parts of Europe and America. But there was this exception. There was this exception in emerging markets. And that exception was what you see on the screen behind me. That was the solar home system. The solar people were willing to pay for the solar home system, to pay a commercial price for the solar home system. Why? Because it improved the quality of their life tremendously. The solar home system powered lights, radio, and TV. It doesn't sound like much. I know it doesn't sound like much, but for customers who were living with kerosene and battery charging as the alternative, it was a massive improvement in their quality of life. This is how most people would get their kerosene, carrying a kerosene bottle back from the local shop and then powering a light. But of course, kerosene gives you a very dim light. And more than that, it's unsafe. There's a real risk of fire in the home at night when people are using kerosene. Also, there, people had to, if you wanted to watch radio or TV, you either bought batteries, which didn't give you much TV, or you got a big battery and you took it backwards and forwards to a grid charging station, which was obviously a lot of, entailed a lot of drudgery and a lot of wasted time and energy for people. So what did a solar home system bring? Very simply, it brought light at the flip of a switch and it brought entertainment into people's homes. I know it doesn't sound like much power. It was only one 50 watt panel on the roof, but the impact on people's quality of lives was immense. So I set about, um, well, further, the, big, the opportunity for this product was enormous. This is the mid 90s looking at the world. This is a World Bank map of the world showing how many people had no clean cooking and how many people had no electricity. The number of people who had no electricity at that time was 1.6 billion people. 1.6 billion people had no electricity. Now, in addition to that, you can add about another billion people who had electricity but in, in name only. Many villages at that time, especially in India, had electricity but it was incredibly unreliable. So for them, it was almost like no electricity at all. Now, the solar home system was a product that offered tremendous promise. It was something that could enhance people's quality of life, as I mentioned. It also gave them savings, amazing savings. They could have three to five year payback on the system, and the solar panel was warranted to last for 25 years. So it was a product that should have diffused very quickly. But unfortunately, it wasn't. It was diffusing slowly through society. And for me, that was a conundrum, it was a paradox. And I set about trying to study that paradox and answer that paradox as part of my PhD at Cambridge University. And while I was there, I was looking for clues. I was looking at literature. I was trying to find out there must be other examples of innovations that have diffused slowly. And I stumbled across this literature called Innovation Diffusion Literature, which I highly recommend to you as a, very fa as a fascinating literature on why innovations diffuse quickly or slowly through society. This is what the innovation diffusion literature came up with over time, the classic S-curve of how a innovation diffuses through society. The early adopters take it, then the later adopters come, it becomes mainstream, and then it reaches saturation. 
But of course, it doesn't always go like that. It doesn't always go so smoothly. And this is exactly what the godfathers of innovation diffusion research found. They found that many technologists believe that the advantageous, the advantageous innovations will sell themselves, but rarely is that true. Most innovations diffuse at a disappointingly slow rate. So I felt better. I felt better about this as I set off to uncover why the solar home system was diffusing more slowly than expected. Uh, so, Fernand, so I, I, I set about uh, studying this. I, I went to India, and here I saw indeed that when a company, I, my case study was in Mangalore, which brought me very close to Bangalore, and I found that when a company set up to sell, install, and service solar for rural communities, people would buy it. But they wouldn't buy it in droves until this happened. So basically, until finance happened. Now, this Indian entrepreneur, this company, because of his credibility in selling solar, was then able to get the National Syndicate Bank to come on board. Now, remember, this is mid-90s, again, a long time ago. And they started financing solar home systems for rural customers. And, and sales took off. Okay. I then went to Indonesia and compared it with another case study of an entrepreneur who was doing the same again, but just at a bigger scale. He set up 40 branches across several provinces of Indonesia. He had salespeople, technicians, and he had his own finance. He was offering four-year finance to rural customers to buy, a solar pro to buy a solar home system. And here it grew even faster, not surprisingly. Now, what did I do? I finished my PhD, and I think as some of you, when you come out of university, might experience, you have a bit of an existential crisis at that time. You think, what am I going to do next? And especially myself, I was very narrowly focused in quite a narrow area on solar energy and emerging markets. Fortunately for me at that time, Shell was getting into the game with a $500 million commitment to renewable energy in 1998. So with all my graphs for my PhD in hand, I went to Shell Center in London thinking, what am I doing here? And I was hired on the spot, which was not what I was expecting. And more than that, I got my dream job. The job I was given was to set up companies in emerging markets that would sell solar home systems to rural customers on a sustainable, profitable basis. That was the, my job, that was my job description. We started in India, naturally, because I knew it. We then went to Sri Lanka, Philippines, Indonesia, China, South Africa. Now, I want to take you into a little case study of Sri Lanka because here is where I found that my findings from my PhD came into reality. This was a Shell Solar Center. Believe it or not, the Shell, Shell's brand was associated with solar across 20 branches in Sri Lanka. From that solar center, we did sales, installation, and service. But more than that, what we did was then team up with local microfinance institutions to provide the finance. So customers could either pay in cash or they could take a loan from what were effectively like local banks. And it wasn't just us that did it. Once we started, we found a lot of people came in until there was broad so awareness about this innovation in rural areas. This is a billboard from, you know, out in the middle of a rural area of Sri Lanka showed, depicting a solar home system. And these were competitors setting up the branch network. And what happened in the end? What happened in the end was that we saw this incredible rapid diffusion of solar home systems. Why? Because companies were making it available to customers on a doorstep, and there were microfinance institutions financing it. So the S-curve that I talked about started to take off, and you can see that behind me. I felt particularly happy because for me, this, these were the findings of my research. I'd been able to put them into practice, and lo and behold, it had worked. Now, the only problem was that by 2006, Shell had decided that its tryst with solar was done, that it would be exiting the solar industry. And we tried to spin out the businesses I had set up, but we couldn't. And it was a, that was a tough pill to swallow because we had to start from scratch. So what did I do? Well, I put my head down and I wrote a business plan. I wrote a business plan for how to set up a large-scale solar company focused on off-grid solar. I pitched it. I pitched it in Singapore where I was living. I pitched it in India. I pitched it in... Uh, I pitched it in the UK, I pitched it in Europe, I pitched it in America, and I got a lot of rejections. Finally, I met somebody who knew a high net worth individual who was actually managing a part of his money by the name of Tom Singh. And he said, you gotta go talk to Tom. So off I flew to London, met Tom in his, in his penthouse in Mayfair. Tom was a high net worth individual who'd set up New Look Fashion in the UK and Europe. Very successful entrepreneur, a great guy. And I pitched to Tom, and he had one question for me, which is good for you, all of you to remember if you think of your own business. He said, how much money are you willing to put into this? And I told him, I thought about hedging my bets, but I just, said, I just gave him a number, which was all my savings. And he said, okay, then I'll double it. 
And there we were, we had the first pool of cash with which to attract more money. So by the time I'd finished, we had about $2.5 million as startup capital for a new company, which we called Orb Energy. Now, what, what did we do at Orb Energy? First, we started with a scaled up model of what I did at Shell Solar. These are branches, this is the branch network that we had. We had 170 branches reaching out to customers across four states of India, trying to get as close to the customer as we could to give them good solar solutions with reliable after sales service. And in addition, just in one state alone, like Karnataka, we teamed up with 10 partner banks who would finance it. And sales were great, sales took off. But by 2012, so about five years, five full years after we'd been in business, I realized that it was time to think about a pivot. Why do I say that? Because electricity supply was improving to rural areas and the, an off-grid solar system was really, oper was really in, a, in a shrinking market. People had less and less need for solar, in off-grid solar, because the electricity supply was improving. Now, who wants to be in a shrinking market, right? So we started to look at what, uh, what other markets were improving, and what we saw is that as the cost of solar was coming down, so a new opportunity was emerging. When we started Orb Energy, the cost of a solar panel was $4 a watt. $4 a watt. Today, it's 10 cents a watt. Over 20 years, the cost of solar energy has fallen 40-fold. It's a phenomenal. Now, of course, by around 2012, where I was thinking of a pivot, that cost, first it had dropped from four to about a dollar and a half after the financial crisis. Then by 2000, it was about a dollar a watt, and now it's 10 cents a watt. Now, as it got to a dollar a watt, new markets opened up. And that new market in particular was the commercial and industrial market. This is an early CNI customer that we served around 2012-13 for making poha in Bangalore. He was one of our first customers to come on board. This is another one, just 100 kilowatts, that we served in Udupi around the same time for fish extraction, for or fish oil extraction um, in, in uh, induction Kannada. It was a, there was, it was clear that this was a, a new opportunity that we had to focus on. So, what did we do? Well, we had to take several strategic steps. First of all, I needed to close 170 branches because you don't need 170 branches to serve the commercial industrial market. Secondly, we need to figure, figure out what we were going to focus on. Well, we were going to focus on the SME sector because having had a lot of salespeople, having had a lot of technicians, we had good reach to rural markets where a lot of SMEs were located. And SMEs are 40% of India's industrial output. It is a huge and segment, and it was an underserved segment. So we decided to focus on the SME. Then when it came to focusing on the SME, the obvious question was, well, who's going to finance solar for this SME? Who's going to do that? I went around to bank after bank after bank. First, I went to Standard Charter, then Ratnakar, then ICICI, then HDFC. Nobody around 2014 was interested to finance the banks. So I went back to my board and shareholders. I said, we have to finance it. We need to finance it. And of course, all of them said to me, wait, but we're not a bank. We're not a bank. And of course they were right, we're not a bank. But what else were we gonna do? The banks were gonna finance it. It was too early, they didn't have the vision for it. They couldn't see where this market was going. So we had to do it. And by 2016, 2017, we piloted our own in-house finance for SMEs. We started at three years, we then grew to five years. From the beginning, there was no collateral required. And then over time, we realized, you don't even have to take a down payment. Because the, the equal monthly installment, the EMI that a SME pays, is less than the savings on day one. So they have every incentive to pay you rather than pay the electricity board. So it's a phenomenal model. Now, this, this finance has exceeded my wildest expectations. We've now, we've now dispersed more than 300 crores, served 300 SMEs for a total of more than 100 megawatts out of our 350 megawatts installed so far. And it's still just small. It's still small, and honestly, it can scale much further. And what did we find as we move forward? That these smaller, so these smaller rooftops soon became bigger rooftops. There was net metering that came into Karnataka. And with net metering, companies could now not only offset the electricity from their daytime use against what they were consuming, but in case they were closed on a Sunday or during the holiday, they could bank that electricity and use it, use it and to offset against their monthly electricity bill. It was a great policy innovation under the National Solar Mission, and Karnataka was a state that led on it. What have we done further? We've set up solar parks for SMEs, which now enable our big, 
bigger SMEs who have big power needs. Imagine companies with electric furnaces, die cast companies, precision component companies. They need a lot of electricity. They can only get 10 or 20% from their rooftop. This is what we did for them. We set up a solar park where they can own sections of it. And under another great policy innovation in India called open access, they can offset what they produce in Arsikeri near Hassan against their electricity bill in Bangalore where their factory is. So where, where does this leave us as a company? In the latest ranking, according to JMK, we are number three in the Indian market behind Tata and Mahindra. By focusing on the SME, by doing in-house finance, we have emerged for rooftop solar as the number three company in India. Now, I've talked about me quite a bit. I just want to end this presentation with four general lessons I'd like you to take away as you move forward with your career. The first, number, the first lesson is don't be afraid to commit to what you love. When you commit to what you love, it's true, you close other doors. You have to say to yourself, yeah, I know I'm closing this door because I'm going to focus on this thing. And that can be hard because in this day and age, there's so many opportunities. Well, if I do this, then I can't do that. But that's okay because when you specialize, you develop unique skills in that area. And when you have unique skills, honestly, you get more job satisfaction. But two, you have the power to control your career. You are unique. And with uniqueness comes a power to control your career. Please take that away with you. Number two is do not listen to the naysayers. When I was starting out, when I was sitting in Shell and I was thinking I want to be an entrepreneur, I had a sort of lunch with a senior person in Shell and he said to me, David, forget it. You need to understand that anybody in Shell is by virtue of being in Shell, not an entrepreneur. I took this as a challenge and I realized that someday I would need to leave Shell to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, realize my dreams. The other thing I'd like to say to you is don't be afraid to fail. I know it's a truism. I know you see it all the time on Instagram. But honestly, don't be afraid to fail because the key is start, and if it doesn't go right, you pivot. And I had, had, I had two big pivots in my life. Number one, when we couldn't spin the businesses out of Shell, we couldn't, I had to start over again. That was a massive pivot. Was I tired? Was I exhausted? Yes. Am I glad that I did it? 100%. Don't be afraid to start. Don't be afraid to fail. You can pivot and you can recover. Okay? And lastly, another truism, it's, I'm sorry if it's corny, but the journey truly is the destination. And sometimes when you're setting out on a big project, on an audacious project, it might be your own business, it might be doing a PhD, it might be setting up a charity, it might be setting up an NGO. Just remember the journey is a destination, okay? I never, the days, the working with Orb Energy have been some of the greatest career experience of my life. Meeting my wife in Bangalore has been the happiest time of my life. Go for it, don't look back, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.